My guest for this session is John Ortberg. John is pastor of Menlo Park Presbyterian Church in Menlo Park, California. He's the author of numerous books, among them, God is Closer Than You Think and The Life You've Always Wanted. He's married to Nancy. They have three kids. Can you name them, John, for us? Laura and Mallory and Johnny. Hey, very good. Mm -hmm. Uh, he loves to play tennis and to read and considers Dallas for Dummies to be part of his ministry. <laughs> it's great to have you, John. Thank you, Rich. It's great to be here with you in your ponytail. <laughs> How can I follow that up? We're thinking together in this session about the evangelical stream the Word-Centered Life. Now remember, the evangelical stream is referring to the good news of the evangel that Jesus brings us into life, real life, and that more abundantly. John, can you help us uh, learn a little bit of how this particular stream has meant to you, how you moved into this. Yeah, Richard, you know, for me, I really grew up in the evangelical stream. Yeah. I mean, in the evangelical world, that's where first Sunday of my life, uh, I, I was born on a Sunday and then I was in the church nursery the next week. Is that right? And um, uh, I went to Wheaton College, which is very much an evangelical mm -hmm. college, and to mm -hmm. Fuller Seminary, which is an evangelical seminary. Mm -hmm. And that world, of uh, knowing the word, loving the word, being shaped by the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's what I was raised in. Was there somebody in that stream, in that tradition, that was particularly helpful to you? Maybe a contemporary person? Or? Well, you know, the, the world in which I grew up, the, the person who I didn't know, but of course knew from afar was Billy Graham. Really, yeah. And uh, in the world where I grew up, really, he was the central figure. He was kind of to mm -hmm. us what the Pope would be to the Catholic Church. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, his commitment to the gospel, right. his proclamation of the gospel, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, that little refrain as he is preaching, the Bible says. The Bible says. That's kind of bedrock sense. That's of the scripture. foundation deal. Yeah. So, so that would be probably the person that for a lot of us kind of symbolized a whole yeah. lot of what we understood yeah, yeah. about the faith. And how is it that this stream has become central you know, to your life, your own living out? What, uh... Well, it really started early. I, I, the church that I grew up in was called the Rockford Gospel Tabernacle. <laughs> I didn't know this until I had left. It was actually initially a four-square church. Oh. And then it left that and became kind of an independent uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, church. And I was seven years old, and it was a Sunday night, uh -huh. and Pastor Boyer, who just passed away this last year, but he really? was the pastor of the church, Pastor Boyer, had preached, and I got in the car with my mom and dad and brother and sister, and I just had this, I can still remember this, this sensation, this very strong feeling of, I want to give my life to Jesus. Wow. And, you know, when you're seven years old, there's a lot you don't understand, but there's a lot I don't understand now. Yeah, But, right. but that, that right. very, very deep sensation of that God is real. Wow. And um, He wants me to belong to Him. He yeah. wants me to be yeah. His child, and I want to tell Him that. Yeah. And um, so I got out of the car with my dad and we went up to this little office in this little church on the west side of Rockford, Illinois. And I knelt uh, down and said, Jesus, yeah. I want you to be in my life and in my heart. Yeah. And um, that was a very formative thing. That was part of the tradition that I grew up, that giving of your life to Christ, right. that conversion. Right. Conversion. Yeah. And I hadn't sinned real deeply because I was only <laughs> seven. Um, but, you know, it was in there. Yeah, sure, <laughs> it was in there. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Now, the evangelical stream is, uh, you know, connected, deeply connected to uh, the Word. And we speak of the Word, you know, in the yeah. sense of Jesus as the Word of God living, the Scripture as the Word of God written, and the Evangel, the, the preached Word, the Word of God spoken. Yeah. Uh, help us think about those three ways of thinking yeah. about a word-centered life. Yeah. W one of the ways that I think about that is it's a little bit like uh, in the American government where there's the three branches oh, of it, and they are checks and balances that help to keep things on the right path and keep things centered. Yeah. So that, um, you know, there is Jesus and he what it all, he's what it all comes down to. We don't need anything other than Jesus. Mm -hmm. But on our own, we can get imbalanced in our view of Jesus. 
and I'll give you a deep theological example of this <laughs> that you're probably not familiar with, a movie called Talladega Nights. <laughs> <laughs> I am not familiar with it. No, I didn't think it. you'd seen it yet because it's kind of a cultured thing. And, um, <laughs> but it features this race car driver played by a guy named Will Ferrell, and he loves to pray to the baby Jesus. Oh, and so whenever he goes to pray, he prays to Jesus, but it's all little tiny infant Jesus and your little crib. And his wife gets really mad at him because she says, you know, he grew up and had a beard and everything. <laughs> but he says, no, 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 I want to pray to the little baby Jesus because he makes me feel good because mm -hmm. to think of this little tender innocent little mm -hmm. baby mm -hmm. there's nothing challenging about that there's nothing threatening about that it's just right. kind of sweet right and right. we all will tend if we just if it's just Jesus we will tend to make him over in our own image mm -hmm. and so the word as the written word mm -hmm. um, helps to correct that give that a yeah, yeah and yeah, says yeah. no I need to come to understand Jesus in the context of the story of God's redemptive history with his people and how does he fit into that story mm -hmm. and then who did he grow up to be and then who did his followers understand him to be and what kind of community did he give birth to mm -hmm. and then if all I do is think about that stuff um, I become like the Dead Sea kind of dead inside because there's no outlet there's no expression mm -hmm. And so to proclaim the word, to talk with other people about it becomes a very, very important thing, not just for other people, not just for uh -huh. people who don't know him yet, but, yeah, yeah. but it helps me because then I remember again that there is nothing that matters like the good news matters. For yeah. somebody who does not know God yeah. to come to Jesus, that is the most important thing in the world and it builds my faith. And as we talk together and they ask me questions, it helps me to see you know, I don't know why I say I believe this, or yeah. this is something that I am trying to convince somebody else about, but I've got doubts about it myself, yep. and it clarifies and purifies my own faith. Yeah. You know, I found uh, a lot of people debate about the Bible, and I find that often it's easier to debate, debate the Bible than it is to submit to it. Yeah. And it is coming to the Scripture and allowing it to form our lives so that we become different kinds of people. Yeah. yeah. Well... I mean, you and Dallas are, are the folks that I have learned so much from, so it feels a little goofy responding to questions about this. But uh, one of the ways that I'll talk about it with folks sometimes is God's goal is not so much for us to get all the way through the Scriptures, it's to get the Scriptures all the way through us. Yeah, yeah. And, and that our biggest problem is that our minds are filled with all kinds of misguided thoughts and intentions and perceptions and feelings. Mm. And our minds are being shaped by stuff all the time, conversations yeah. and yeah. TV shows. And, right. and we tend not to be very intentional about how do we want to shape our minds. Right. How, can you just share anything just out of your own life? How is it that you uh, are shaped yeah. like by Scripture or even by the proclaimed Word? Yeah. Um, you know, when I was younger, I, I thought that, that it was mostly about just getting as much information about Scripture as you can. Mm -hmm. And in the tradition where I grew up, you know, the heroes would be people whose Bibles were real marked up and falling <laughs> apart. Yeah, right. and, and so if you were sitting in church and the preacher was preaching on something and you had marked up that text, you'd offer to share your Bible with the person <laughs> next to you so they could see how underlined it was. <laughs> right. But, you know, if it was Leviticus or something, if you hadn't been there you before, then you'd that. just kind of huddle over here. <laughs> right, right, right. And, uh, and of course, to, you know, all of Scripture has such rich material in it. Mm. Um, but to think that the goal is primarily to have my mind renewed mm -hmm. so that I become the kind of person who is thinking right thoughts and able to just live and able yeah. to do the right thing at the right times. And a lot of what that takes is having certain sections of Scripture that are, are very fundamental and very formative about who God is and about who I am mm -hmm. and thinking about those over and over and over so that those become the path waves that are grooved real deep in the neurons of my brain. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's where you get to things like, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on right. thee. Exactly. And that's just an observation about the way that things are. It's not even a command. It's yeah. just that's what yeah. happens when my mind, whatever my mind is centered in, it will reflect itself in the condition of my yeah. heart, my emotions. One of our Korean team talks about coming to scripture that some people think that you know, their brain is like granite, nothing gets in. Uh -huh. But he, he said, I love the image, he said, you know, once you chisel something into granite, it stays there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that sense, it would actually help me because I can tend to, you know, just struggle with this. But if I can chisel, if, if the Lord would chisel in into the mind. Lincoln acts, Abraham Lincoln said, one of the metaphors he used for his mind was, he said his mind was like a, a sheet of metal. 
and you would have to scratch something in it. And he said it was slow. His mind was slow. But <laughs> once something was scratched in it, it never left. Yeah. And uh, one of his biographers says, and I think it's one of the, it's a great lesson in formation. Lincoln was not widely read. He didn't read a great deal. Mm -hmm. But what he read, he read yeah. over and over and over again. So the Bible and Shakespeare and commentaries on laws. And I think for a lot of us, even in the evangelical world, mm -hmm. we can have piles of books and stacks of magazines mm -hmm. on our bedside table. Yep but nothing gets etched in our minds. Deep, deep. And the point is, uh, let something get etched there. Yeah, I know Lincoln uh, focused on the 23rd Psalm, and actually when you compare um, the Gettysburg Address to the 23rd Psalm, they have exactly the same number of syllables. Huh. There, I mean, there's all kinds of huh. patterns wow. that I think probably just flowed over yeah. into his writing. Can you help us with the evangelical stream in terms of integration with all of the other streams we've been talking about? Uh, how do we do that? Yeah, you know, I think that if you follow any of the streams very deeply, you know, they lead you into the other streams. Yeah. And so there's just simply for you. no way to get the, did I say no, a good I mean, thing? That is good. I, uh, I'll pay you later. Okay, that's I'll look a, forward no, to it, bad. although I don't believe you. Um, uh, because I've worked with Ren Avari before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. You can edit that out. Um, uh, you get dinner. <laughs> but I think, you know, if you, if, if you just start with Jesus and his life, yeah. and then you think, what's it mean to be a disciple, a follower of his? Mm -hmm. Well, for the people who actually did it initially, they would follow him around and do the things that he did. Yeah. So, you know, once you start to study him in the scripture, then you start to see he would go away for long stretches of time mm -hmm. to be alone with the Father and pray. Mm -hmm. And so there's no way to look at that and take it seriously without saying, well, if he felt like he needed to do that, yeah. then how could I not feel yeah. like I need yeah, to do yeah. that? And then I need help with that. So I start talking with other people. I pray for people to come by. Mm -hmm. I can remember uh, reading about the disciples saying, Lord, teach us to pray. Yeah. And then thinking about that, and because right. I, because you know, I grew up in the church, but I didn't know how to pray. We yes. talked about pray uh, a lot in the evangelical tradition, right? And we would talk about answers to prayer a lot. But what do you do when you go to pray? What do you do when your mind starts to wander? Yep. What are you actually thinking about? How do you listen to God? All that stuff I didn't know. And so I spent probably the better part of a year where my main prayer was, God, send me someone who can teach me how to pray. Mm and then eventually ended up getting connected with a woman, a nun, who was at a uh, retreat center, Catholic mm -hmm. Center for Spirituality in mm -hmm. Orange County. Mm -hmm. And um, we went through the Ignatian exercises. Mm -hmm. And so that led into another stream. But there's, if you go deep enough into any stream, there's just no way to avoid. Right, going elsewhere. Yeah, it's just, you follow a stream along and eventually you're gonna come to the river. Because these are all meant to flow together. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Is there a passage of scripture that could just anchor the evangelical stream for us? Well, you know, I, I think of the summaries in the Gospels as Mark 1, 14 and 15. Mm. From the time John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. Uh, the time has come, he said. Yeah, the yeah, kingdom yeah. of God is at hand. Uh, Repent uh, and believe, trust in, arrange your life around yeah. this good news. Yeah. You know, I think that's one of the wonderful things in the evangelical stream is uh, this constant emphasis and helping us to think about the value of the proclaimed word, the yeah. good news. Yeah. That's good news, not the kind of stuff. I mean, uh, we've got a culture that's kind of jaded by uh, these things, but but really, I mean, I remember when I first read St. Francis and stories about him, I'm going, mm -hmm. this is a proclaimer of good news, the yeah. Dominicans and yeah. these order of preachers and all of these things, uh, the Lollards and, and so many, many, many people like that, that just speaking forth, Wesley's, uh, you know, itinerant yep. evangelists, they yep. just would speak forth in, in and wonderful And I do ways. think one of the big challenges always is, how do you find fresh ways to proclaim yeah. the good news? Yeah in a way that people in your time will hear. Right, exactly. And so, you know, exactly. the kingdom was a very rich metaphor that Jesus used for the people of Israel. Um, a little and, different for folks in Greece at that time. And so when right. you go through Paul, he uses that language, but not nearly as much as Jesus did because right. he had to find other ways to communicate exactly. that. Exactly. And in our day, one of the crying needs is, how do we bring the whole good news, the mm -hmm. whole gospel to our culture? In a culture? way that people can hear it and receive it. Yeah, yeah. yeah because language always changes and uh, uh, there's a, 
special that was on CCN, I think last night, called What is a Christian? <laughs> and it was so interesting because the clips they were using to promote it were scenes from a church where some guy was talking about some kind of weird end time views. And if mm. you don't believe that right yeah, now exactly. is the end times, then you're not really a Christian. And then how it gets all interwoven with certain political movements in our day. And that kind of divisive separatist definition of what does it mean to be a Christian. That's right. what a lot of folks in our culture that, hear. That's what they think of. And it's not it? good news. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I love news. in uh, Eugene Peterson's uh, translation, the message mm -hmm. in that passage on Acts 2, the last line, the way that he translates it was, and in general, people liked what they saw. Yeah, isn't that? The community was the good news, and then just the comment, and in general, people liked what they saw. Yeah, and you think in our day, if people looked at churches and Christians, yeah. and in general, they'd yeah, yeah. like what they see. Can you give us some sense of maybe how we today might, I mean, with integrity, not just pandering to the culture, but might make this good news an appealing thing that people would like mm. what they see. Mm. Do you have any counsel for us? Well, you know, one of the scary things about that one is there's no way to do it just through clever words. Mm. You know, m mostly it's about the kind of lives that we're living. And, and always, especially, you know, I work at a church. That's mostly what I do. And right. so we try to think about how can we reach our community for right. Christ. And that's a very important thing. Right. But always the temptation is to think, there will be a slogan, there will be a metaphor, mm -hmm. there will be a program, there will be something mm -hmm. that can enable us to reach a whole lot of people that bypasses the need for us to be transformed. Right, right. And the reality is, and this is such a deep part of what Renovare is about and the streams are yeah. about is, if we are living that kind of life, yep. it will come out in words and you can't stop it. Yeah. And if we're not living that kind of life, no, then no. even if we get a lot of people to sign up for our programs, our churches, or something, all we're doing is reduplicating ourselves. Yeah. I and remember really that uh, passage in Acts where Jesus said, told the disciples to wait uh, to receive the power of the Spirit, and you will be my witnesses, he says. I mean, yeah. uh, when you look at the disciples so often, uh, what they were witnessing to was their own anger, their own frustrations, their own... but with a life with God and the formation of the life, then you can become witnesses yeah. to a life. Yep. And, uh, and that's what we look for. in the And then I think part of it too, in the proclamation of the word, a lot of the proclamation is listening. Yeah, you know, very good. So much of what Jesus does with people is to ask them questions. Yeah. What do you yeah. want? That kind of attentiveness. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. then because really, because much of proclamation depends on what's the other person able to hear. Right, exactly. And if we don't sit together and I don't listen to you and listen to the culture yep. and, and, and find out where people's minds are, mm. then there's just a complete mess. And that happens all the time. You bet. John, is there some word that you could give to those who are watching this uh, series that would encourage them or help them or move them forward a little mm -hmm. bit. We, we, we just all so desperately need a yeah. kind of way to think about these things. Yep. Maybe you could help us. Yep, I would love to. Um, at the church where I work, uh, Richard and Dallas were out uh, about a year ago. And um, in one of the services, Dallas and I just walked through different elements of a worship service. And I would ask him, hey, Dallas, why do we do that? And then he would talk. And I said, I don't understand that. And then he would talk some more. But at the end of it came time for a blessing, for a benediction. And so he talked about the power of blessing, that uh, the word spoken for another person on behalf of God is such a powerful thing. And then he walked over to the edge of the stage and he gave a blessing to our congregation. And I would like to give this blessing to you as an encouragement. Dallas said, I believe that what Jesus would say to you today is what he said to Zacchaeus. Remember that little fellow? Jesus said to him, today, I'm coming to your house. You're right there in your life, in all the stuff that you have gotten wrong and all the things you don't understand and everything that might be confusing to you, aspects of your life that seem insignificant or hidden or dark or fearful. Jesus would say to you right now, today, I'm coming to your house. I want to be with you. And it doesn't matter that there's a lot of stuff you don't get right right now. His desire is to be with you. And if you're just open to that, if there's anything in your heart right now that's responding, that's Jesus at work in you. Mm. He's coming to your house today. Mm. And that's good news. 
That's good That's news. good news. That's good news. Yeah. John, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure to be Thank with you. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Your book, Hearing God, uh, you make a case for a person that they would be better mm -hmm. off if they were to focus on a few key verses than right. just trying to get through the whole Bible. Well, uh, there's a problem with reading the Bible in groups that tend to call themselves Bible believing, and that mm -hmm. is that they get legalistic about reading mm -hmm. the Bible, mm -hmm. and they tend to associate it with righteousness. Mm -hmm. And, and you see many people that are cursed with guilt because they didn't read so many verses of the Bible today and so yeah, on. Yeah. Uh, perhaps an afternoon every two weeks where you do nothing but read the Bible in solitude would be much more effective yeah. than trying to work in 15 minutes of duty per day yeah, right. and then you're done with it. Right, right. Uh, the intensity uh, of Bible reading is much more important, mm -hmm. and, and that builds up over time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. reading a whole gospel, right. you, you'll notice many of the lives of the great saints when they were making a breakthrough. They did things like, like A.B. Simpson, I think he read the New Testament uh, five times in a week or something right. like right. that. Right. Right. And, uh, and I uh, use this in retreats to get people to doing something that repeats the same thing intensively. Mm. It's much more effective mm. than, than a, a figure I like to use is you can't get a shower one drop at a time in 50 years. Yeah, right. You know, you have to you have, have the to downpour. Get immersed enough. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And this memorizing passage is, is in that same mm -hmm. vein. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think one of the things that prevents people from benefiting from the word is that they do not read the larger units. They don't never get them before them. Mm -hmm. They tend to take it Just like little, little pills. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. and the little pills, they don't add up. How has the evangelical stream impacted your own life? Well, since I was, uh, uh, I rem I, I, I've been in church ev forever, right? <laughs> and that has been a, such a blessing to me. Hmm. And it has mainly been because these were churches where even as a child, the scriptures and memorization of scriptures hmm. and study of the scriptures was, it is just, uh, the short answer is, Richard, it has simply framed my life and given hmm. me a perspective or vantage point from which I can do everything else. Yeah. And like yeah. all of the stuff that I do in philosophy or mm -hmm. other areas, it's all, it has a framework. Yep. That's and that is. framework is uh, the Word of God. I remember the old hymn, How Firm a Foundation, mm -hmm. You Saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent Word. Mm -hmm. And it is so true.